وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today with the grace of Allah عز وجل we'll try to conclude the tips that we started eight days ago in introducing the guidelines of how to correct mistakes, errors, and sins of others in the shade of the methodology of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as guided to us in the Sharia. And afterwards we will start by mentioning samples and examples of incidents where the Prophet Sallallahu sets the ground rules of mistakes and how to rectify them and rebuke them. The last tip, or one of the last, is that when we rebuke a youngster who makes a mistake, this should be done with wisdom and in a manner appropriate to the child's age. We have a big problem when it comes to admonishing, reprimanding, rebuking, and correcting the mistakes of children. We tend to make them grow faster than their actual age, and we expect from them more than should be expected from such children. And this is wrong. We are depriving, depriving them from their childhood. We are causing them psychological problems and not helping them grow up naturally. If you see a child, three or four years old, sitting next to his father or, or to his mom, for an hour or two and not moving and not playing around, don't be astonished and say, MashaAllah, what a nice boy, what a nice child, well brought up. Rather than say, there's something wrong with this child. This is not natural. A child this age should be jumping around, breaking things, shouting, fighting, crying. This is the norm. This is why they are children. The pen of accountability has been lifted, has been uplifted so that they're not accountable for what they do. Therefore, we have to understand how these children are in order to be able to bring them up to be effective, responsible, and beneficial to their community and to their religion. Abu Hurairah tells us that once the grandchild, the grandson of the Prophet والسلام, Al Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father and with his mother, the son of Ali and Fatima. Al Hassan was a little young child. He saw a date on the ground, so he took it and put it, placed it in his mouth, attempting to eat it. This was a mistake, but it was a child who could not differentiate between what's right and what's wrong. Nevertheless, the Prophet ﷺ corrected this mistake, and he took it 
out of his mouth saying kikh kikh and this is a persian word and we use it also in arabic a lot meaning that this is not appropriate kikh take it out and he said to him don't you know that we the descendants of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the household of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam do not consume charity sadaqa is not permissible for the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam nor for his descendants as per the hadith of salman al farisi the seeker of truth who came to medina and when he recognized that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the prophet and messenger of allah he wanted to verify this through what he had read about him in the scriptures and that is he eats a gift but does not eat or consume charity so one day he brought some food and the prophet was with his companions and he presented it to the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the prophet asked what is this so salman said this is charity this is sadaqa so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam refrained from eating from it and ordered his companions to eat the following day salman may allah be pleased with him brought another plate of food and gifted it to the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the prophet said what is this salman said this is a gift it's not a charity it's a gift so the prophet said bismillah and started to eat from it and ask his companions to share in so the prophet teaching this young child tells us that children though they are not accountable yet they are susceptible to be taught and they are supposed to be prevented from doing what is haram even if they're children so for example we know that children are not accountable sometimes people give our children gold lockets or ornaments jewelry so you see some mothers allow their children to wear a necklace or a bracelet made of gold though he's a male he's a son and we know that men or males are not allowed in islam to wear gold gold so when you speak to the mother she says he's a child yes he is a child and not accountable but you are you're a mother you're a parent you're the one who's who'll be held accountable when they start to draw living things a human being an animal we should tell them that this is not permissible you can draw anything else you can draw landscape moons suns mountains trees oceans anything but not living creatures and this is why it is wrong for us to bring them coloring books that has living creatures let alone cartoon figures or action figures and the likes with which may corrupt and brainwash them from an early age so yes we rebuke children but in an appropriate way and listen to this beautiful story of umar ibn abi salama may allah be pleased with him and with his father Abu Salama one of the first to migrate to Medina and his mother Um Salama who when she became a widow the prophet married her and she became the mother of the believers may Allah be pleased with her Umar ibn Abi Salama was the stepson of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and he was of a young age like 4 5 maybe 6 years of age and once the prophet was eating sallallahu alaihi wasallam and umar joined in as a youngster he was picking food from all over the place and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
corrected this mistake. And again, notice, nothing goes unchecked under the radar. The Prophet والسلام, when he sees something wrong, he corrects it. But with the appropriate strategy and diplomacy and approach. As he is the perfect teacher sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So he said to the boy, O oh young boy, say bismillah. Eat with your right hand and eat from what is in front of you. Three short phrases, direct to the point, but very informative. Something that would resonate in his mind forever. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, this remained my way of eating from that time on. These three phrases never left my subconscious, never left my memory. Say Bismillah before you start to eat. And this is how we should deal with our children when they're one or two years of age. This is how we bring them up. You are astonished how Muslim kids behave in such a fashion? We teach them from an early age how to say La ilaha illallah. How to say Bismillah before eating or drinking. How to always eat with the right hand and not with their lefty, even if they're lefties. They don't eat with their left hand ever. Some of my children are lefties. But when it comes to eating and drinking, never. They would raise their left hand to their mouth. Because this is how they were brought up out of conviction and belief in Allah Azza wa and following the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Umar said, this remained my way of eating from that time on. Say Bismillah. Eat with your right hand. Unfortunately, nowadays we see elders in restaurants holding the fork with the left, the knife with the right, cutting the food, eating with their left, drinking with the left. And if you bring it up to their attention would they concede would they agree would they say jazakallahu khairan for correcting us and reminding us they feel uptight their arrogance kicks in and some may reject the ruling altogether and say if Allah created two hands for us what's the point of not using one a'udhu billah the same analogy, the same way of thinking that Satan did when he rejected to prostrate to Adam, peace be upon him, defying the straight command and order from Allah for him to prostrate. These arrogant people still exist today and you can sense their defiance and resentment to some of the Sharia laws in their rhetoric. This exposes what's in their hearts. Yes, they look Muslims. They look normal like us. But when you look a little bit closer, you'll find that they're not like us. They have something wrong with their hands. They are aliens. It's the rhetoric that exposes them. These little words that express their resentment to the Sharia, their defiance, their arrogance. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect all of us. And I hope you're not one of those. When addressed with something from the Sharia, you would reject it and feel uptight about it. This is a, a clear sign of hypocrisy. And alongside the points that we should learn before correcting other people's mistakes, we should not exaggerate. 
some of us tends to inflate things way off proportion, exaggerate. So a trivial small thing, he would make an issue out of it. Achi, yes, that was a mistake, but measure the mistake as it's supposed to be and not exaggerate. It's like someone killing a mosquito with a cannon. Yes, the, 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 the mosquito will die alongside everyone in the room or the house. You have caused more damage than what was supposed to. So do not exaggerate mistakes and deal with them as they are supposed to be dealt with in the same size, in the right course of action. Also, some people tend to make it personal. What do you mean? I've noticed this in WhatsApp group, in social media, in some family discussions. When you find that there this this urge of extracting a confession out of the person who made a mistake. Why are you doing this? This is not personal. No, he has to confess. I have to prove to him that he was wrong. Okay, okay he acknowledged that he was wrong. Move on. No, he has to confess. Achi, stop rubbing it. It hurts. And sometimes it backfires. You're causing the person who made the mistake to become defiant, to become defensive, and maybe to reject the truth because of your approach. Not every time you see a mistake, you are required to extract a confession. Acknowledge it's a mistake. Show the other party, show the sinner or the person who made that error that it was an error and move on. Don't require and demand a confession and to state that he was wrong. This is not your job. This is not something that is helpful or healthy. Also, if someone was so indulged in that mistake or sin for a long time, sometimes it's almost impossible to quit immediately. Though this is what is expected from a true, real Muslim. However, a person may try an attempt and most likely would relapse. This is not the end of the world. So give them some time, give them some space while continually advising them and trying with them and, and being helpful and supportive. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't start pointing fingers and accusing others and maybe blaming them for being a failure, you'll never make it. Someone who was on the habit, could not kick the habit, who used to smoke for 30 years, sometimes it's impossible to ask them to stop and quit immediately. They need time to wean off. So instead of meeting them next week and saying, <gasps> You still smoke. Don't you fear Allah? I showed you last week all the evidence and the proofs that this is haram, this is khabith, and you're still smoking. Instead, be supportive. Oh, mashallah, I see that instead of going for a smoke every five or 10 minutes, now you're taking like an hour. So you've reduced the amount. That's good, that's good. I hope, inshallah, in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to, to kick the habit for good. There's a difference in these two approaches. 
and the most likely to attain results is the latter one. When you're being supportive, when you're encouraging people, when you're being positive, instead of rushing things up. When you rush things up, you may end up with a lot of disappointment because you rush things up. It's like cooking. If you're preparing a meal, if you rush things up, it's not, a, it's not going to be cooked. People will not be able to consume it and eat it because you rush things up. Let it marinate, give it some time, especially if that sin took a long time in a person's life. And finally, not making the one who makes the mistake feel like an opponent because the aim is to win people over not to score points against them. So many times we discuss with other Muslims who make mistakes. And you say to them, Akhi, the clip or the video you sent has music in it, has inappropriate material in it, has free mixing, has women, has bad content. These people may be divided into two types. One would accept and say, Jazakallahu khairan. It's a very good remark. I accept your opinion and I'll look into it. Or I beg to differ, but Jazakallah khair for the advice. The other part or the other type of people who are argumentative. If you tell them that this is the sun in midday, they would argue, how do you know it's not another solar system or it's another planet or it's a spotlight or this or that, it's a mirror. A'udhu billah. Such people don't even put the effort to argue with them. Just say, you're right, move on. Why? This is what shaitan tries to do to corrupt your heart. That individual, it's his habit. If you go and check with his wife, his children, his colleagues, his friends, his relatives, you'll find that they all avoid engaging in discussion with him because it's fruitless. The moment you engage in discussion, you become an opponent. You're not having a healthy discussion. He just wants to win. Not the battle, rather the whole war. He wants to score a point. He has a hidden agenda. He wants to prove that he knows, he does this, he does that. If you go down to his level, you're like him. Don't waste time. Don't tarnish your heart's purity. Don't engage your head with such fights that has no value to Islam or to you personally or to that individual who's not gonna accept the truth. Let him be. Just say, you're right, move on. What you had done initially was to say a comment for the sake of Allah. You did that. You remember the first episode in our Ramadan series? We said that tip number one, the most important tip in correcting people's mistakes is sincerity. Don't ever make it personal. It was reported that Ali ibn Abi Talib was once fighting, and he's a fierce soldier, was once fighting with an idol worshiper at war in the battlefield. And while he was fighting with him and was about to kill him, the idol worshiper spat in his face. Ali refrained from fighting him and went to fight someone else. So his companions told him, what are you doing? 
you were just about to kill this kafir. He said, I was doing it for the sake of Allah. And when he spat on my face, I wanted to avenge myself and I said, nope, this is not for Allah Azzawajal, anymore. So I refrained. Don't make people who do mistakes your opponents. Don't make it personal. Always excel. Always be on top. Do it for the sake of Allah Azzawajal. If you feel that the discussion is going out of hand, leave them be. They're not going to change. They're not here to know the truth. People are not here to know the truth and learn. They're here to argue. They're here to score a point, to fulfill their hidden agendas. You don't have time for this. Life is too short. Move on. Another one bites the dust. Who cares about them? There are so many eager to hear your advice and take it in and embrace it and implement it because they know you're sincere and they themselves are sincere. Focus on them. Leave those to be and to find other venues for them to practice whatever they want to practice and life will certainly go on. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the ummah of his virtues no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of abu bakr helped me among the benefits of this narration it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the prophet of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them, is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, Albani ruled it authentic in his book Sahih Al-Jami'. The explanation of As-Sindi on the book of Ibn Majah and At-Taysir Bisharh Al-Jami' As-Saghir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Our first caller has been to Inayatullah from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Shaykh. Alaikum wa rahmatullah. I should have requested my Muslim brothers and sisters to pray for my mother who is not well. Um, Shaykh, a brother earlier asked you a question regarding gift possession between husband and wife that isn't acknowledged unless possession is taken. 
So Shrek, if you remember, my earlier question was regarding her husband buying his wife's jewelry, but he does not even take possession of it. It remains with the wife that both of them knowing that it remains the property of the wife. I just want to know if he has to take the physical possession of it, and would he pay the future zakah even if the wife in the back of her mind still intends it to be her property? And lastly, I hope Shrek, it isn't in any way a pretending scenario. Because technically, rather if the if the man bought the jewelry from his wife and gave her the money while she's still possessing the jewelry, and he also gave her the jewelry itself, this is a gift, both the money and the jewelry. We're talking about a gift to a spouse, a gift to a brother, that there is no possession of it. This gift is not binding and it's not finalized until the person possesses that gift. A man says, I give you my car. I'm happy. Zakallah khair for giving me your car. He doesn't give me the keys. He doesn't give me the car. He doesn't transfer the deeds in my name. And after a month, I say, where is my car? He says, I changed my mind. No problem. After a month, he dies. I go to his heirs and I say, listen, I have five men testifying that he gave me his car. But he did not give me the keys, nor the possession, nor transferred the deeds. The gift is invalid. It doesn't take place. This is different from a man buying his wife's uh, uh, pond jewelry or whatever jewelry she has or whatever debt she has and he gives her the money as a gift not to acquire the gold for himself rather he's giving her the gift and the gold itself there's no problem in that Suad from the UK Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Alaikum Assalam uh, Sheikh I'm a, I'm a lefty I write with my left however I eat with my right hand and drink with my right hand but when it comes to brushing my teeth, I struggle using my right hand and sometimes end up using my left hand to brush my teeth. Is that okay? Jazakallah khair. What jazakum? The scholars differed in terms of using the miswak, the toothbrush. Some say it's best to use the right hand because it's a sunnah. Others say it's best to use the left hand because it's removing dirt and filth. So both sides have a legitimate reason, cause, and hence, you have no problem, none whatsoever, to use the left hand to brush your teeth because the prohibition that the Prophet ﷺ taught us was to eat and drink and give and receive with the left hand and he justified this by saying because shaitan eats and drinks and gives and ha hands out and receives with his left hand and allah knows best ireland from kosovo ireland Farhan from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam to Allah. Sir, last time my question was unanswered. My question is Is there any punishment for disrespecting books, money, or food? And if there's no punishment, is fearing that disrespecting these things might affect our future. For example, if I disrespect money, some people say that I might not get it. Is this sh fear shirk? Jazakum la jazakum. There is no prescribed punishment for disrespecting these things. So there is nothing in the Quran or in the Sunnah that says if you step on a $5 bill or if you push uh, books of physics with your foot that you're going to be paralyzed or you're going to skip dinner tonight. And if one says that, oh, if I do this, something evil would happen, 
This is superstition. And it's not shirk. If you believe that these things could backfire and cause you harm, this is shirk. But if you're superstitious, this is also part of shirk. As Ibn Mas'ud narrated, may Allah be pleased with him, that at-tiyaratu shirk. وَمَا مِنَّا إِلَّا إِلَّا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُذْهِبُهُ بِالتَّوَكُّلُ Believing in bad omens is shirk. And none of us is exempted from that. But Allah Azza wa Jal takes it away with tawakkul, with trusting and reliance on Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ubay from Tunis. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, I just want to make myself clear about yesterday's question. I meant uh, those foamy prayer mats that people place on top of the masjid's carpet. If we find ourselves next to them and it's a tight spot, our hand or uh, part of our forehead will be on top of it. So what to do in, the, in this situation? No problem. As I said and explained yesterday, Akhi. Muhammad from the Emirates. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam Ramadan, thank uh, Ramadan Mubarak to you and your family as well. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I was in congregation in uh, Salat al uh, They made me uh, to become Imam. And uh, I was a little nervous. I forgot to, to say, Rabbana uh, walaka alhamd. Is my Salat wrong? You, what did you say? You just uh, uh, raised from the Rukur without saying anything? I said, Sami Allahu liman hamida, but I did not say, Rabbana walaka alhamd. This is mandatory for you to say, and if you missed it, you should have offered sujood as-sahu. If you did not offer sujood as-sahu due to your ignorance or not uh, remembering, your salat is, is, is valid, inshallah, and there is nothing for you to do uh, as of now. Hamza from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I apologize, I answered my question yesterday. Um, so my question was, in short, um, do you have to say what you want or I have verbally? Like, that's the question. I have no idea what you're talking, Akhi. If you can speak in clear English, I'd appreciate it. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, when you make a du'a, you have to say what you want verbally? You have to say what you want verbally, or how would you make a du'a? Just by thinking about it? Hamza? Yeah, that's, that's not the right way. You have to say it verbally. Yeah, so when you want to make dua, you have to verbalize it. You can't just stay there, look at the ceiling, and make duas in your head. And No, this is not valid. You have to actually articulate it. Say, Allahumma laka alhamdu hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala abdika rasulika nabiyyina Muhammad. Allahumma ghfir li, Allahumma arham li, Allahumma arzuqni, Allahumma do this and that for me. You have to verbalize it and say it. A man from India. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think I read in Islam Q and A that doing akbar after salah in a mild voice is sunnah except three fools and two fools each. But when except I'm what? Doing akbar after salah in mild voice. Sunnah except three kuls and ayatul kursi. Okay. But uh, when I apply this sunnah in the masjid after salah, the problem is the whole masjid hears only my voice because the masjid is silent. So how should I do it properly? This is an issue of dispute among scholars. And the reason behind that is a hadith that was narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah May Allah be pleased with a man with his father, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said, we, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, who were not in the masjid at the time, knew that they finished salat by their raising their voices with the takbir. Now, this hadith caused a lot of confusion especially for those from the subcontinent who immediately after giving assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. They say الله أكبر. What are you doing? Said this is what Ibn Abbas said. Then they say استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله سبحان الله من السلام. This is wrong. The hadith was referring to what is known in Arabic as التغليب. What is that? He was referring to the athkar, the whole athkar, by one single word, which is at-takbir. Like when the Arabs say, here comes the two Umars. We have one Umar, Ibn al-Khattab. They're referring to Abu Bakr and Umar. So instead of saying, here comes Abu Bakr and Umar, they say, Ja al umaran The two Umars came. And also, Mother Aisha said, we did not lit light fire in the houses of the Prophet ﷺ to cook for two months. So when she was asked, what was your food? She said, the two blacks, Al-Aswadan. What are they? Dates and water. Whoa, dates are, is black, but water? So this is called taghlib. When you look, at the sun and the moon, you say Al-Qamaran, the two moons. So this is what the companion said, At-Takbir, meaning that they would raise their voices, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika, la hamulku, alhamdu ala kulli shayin qadir, la ilaha illallah, and so on. But what to be said immediately after Salam is mentioned in the hadith of Thawban, the servant of the Prophet ﷺ. He used to say, the Prophet, whenever he concluded his salat, he used to say immediately, Astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma anta salam, minka salam, tabarak ya dal jalali wa ikram. This is the first thing you say. Secondly, raising their voices is problematic. Why? Because there are other hadiths that the Prophet ordered them, alayhi salatu wasalam, to lower their voices. He once came out and saw them engaging in dua and in dhikr in loud voice. So he reprimanded them and said, lower your voices because you're not calling someone who's deaf or far away. You're calling someone who is all hearing, all responding and close to you. So they lowered their voices. Sheikh al-Albani says, to me, it seems that in the beginning, they were ordered to raise their voices with dhikr so that it would propagate the message of Islam and show the enemies of Islam the strength and power of Islam. But after people learned the athkar and it became part of their lives, they were ordered to lower their voices so that they would not harm others. And this is noticeable. If you're sitting in the masjid doing your adhkar after the conclusion of the prayer, and another jama'ah starts, and the imam recites the fatiha and another surah in the second jama'ah, you're totally distracted. You can't even recite ayatul kursi yourself because you're listening to him reading the Fatiha and you're mixed up. So my advice to you, do not whisper and do not raise your voice with the adhkar. Just simply say it in a tone that you only hear it by saying, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Rather than doing La ilaha illallah, raising it and everybody's looking at you, what is this guy doing? Some of the brothers do this in masjids and it's annoying. I can do it louder than you do. This, it's not a competition. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Maria from Australia. Maria. Fahim from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, today many Muslims who academically belong to science background and try to do self-study of the Quran and Sunnah, some of them claim that Quran supports Darwinism evolution and also claim the presence of mathematical miracles and many other correlations with science. 
my question is is it appropriate for students of science to draw conclusions by just reading few blogs articles without having in depth knowledge of quran and sunnah especially like you want the, these people these people are arrogant imbeciles they're neither scientific nor logical because it's like them claiming to be academic and scientific and going into a field that is totally not theirs. If they're physicians, they go and talk about geology and how the earth was formed. And all the geologists look at them and say, these guys are a nutcase. These guys are crazy. And likewise, when they speak about the Quran and the Sunnah, we, people of Sharia, people of Quran, people of Arabic, people of Sunnah, Say, these guys are imbeciles. They're ignorant. Who cares what they say? These are fame seekers. They don't know Arabic. They have no background in studying Quran or Sunnah. They're just talking from their own whims and desires. People who want recognition, who want to be famous, like that ignorant imbecile who came years back saying that Alif Lam Mim and Hamim and Kaf Haya Ain Saad, these are Aramaic letters that mean so and so and so. So he discovered the new proton or the quantum physics theory. He says that I've discovered something the companions didn't know of, the Tabi'in didn't know of, nobody knew of. Because I studied Hebrew, I studied this, and now I know what it means. Subhanallah. This can be blasphemous. When you come and claim that this means so and so in the Quran without any proof or basis. And not only that, claiming that the Quran is not Arabic. So don't, don't ever listen to such ignorant imbeciles. Even they have a couple of PhDs under their belt. Because it has no value in Islam. They just want recognition and to be pointed to and to be uh, 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 yani, um, recognized. Yumna from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam. Uh, I have a question. My husband is an army officer. He was appointed to a civil club having restaurant, gym, talent court, etc. Uh, where his interaction was with wealthy and rich people. He was appointed to what? Uh, it was a, a club where uh, it was a combination of restaurant and uh, gym and uh, swimming pool and he was there a secretary. So his, his job is what? To protect it or to guard it? Uh, to deal it. To deal it in all terms. To it do, was to do million, what? Uh, of a, to deal in everything. Oh, yeah, to manage it. Yes, to manage it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, people, they asked him for favor, and he favored them. And in return, they presented uh, my husband with expensive gifts, like um, um, the, uh, dry fruits, clothes, and uh, few asked him for uh, invest in shares and in land and all this. Okay, the question. Allah knows best. He demanded them or uh, they gave him by themselves. And I am in doubt if all this is haram or... Uh... All of this, all of this is haram. Every single penny that he's getting from them or favor that he's getting from them is known in Islam as bribe, rashwa. And the Prophet said, may Allah curse the one who gives it and may Allah curse the one who receives it. So your husband is cursed those who give him asking for such favors are cursed as well if your husband was not managing the club they would not even give him an old pair of shoes as a gift he they're giving him what they're giving him because of his position yet he's getting a salary from the army and from the government anything he takes from them is haram for him but it is halal for you and for his children he's the one who's going to be burnt in hell because of it you guys can enjoy it without any problem and Allah knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow same time. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا 